it seems that if all of these accusations are false, you are the unluckiest and most persecuted man that any of us has ever heard about. <laughs> oh, I don't know what you want me to say. I, I don't think that these have been the best days of my life. My name is Matt Orchard, and welcome back to 5050 Bias Both Ways. This is a podcast where I talk to the most controversial people that I can find and then deliver two incredibly lopsided interviews back to back. The first half hour is as cordial as I can make it, and the second is as contentious as humanly possible. All right. Well, over a year and a half since I wrapped the uh, the first season of this project, so uh I've got a little bit of housekeeping to do, and the intro to today's subject will uh, also be significantly longer than they have been historically, for reasons that I'll explain in just a bit. Um, so I'll just say up front, to anyone who is listening to this solely because there are uh, followers of the Penn State sex abuse scandal and the case of Jerry Sandusky, and they, you know, you just want to listen to the damn interview, you will want to skip to about 11 minutes 40. All right, so in late 2017, I made this limited edition podcast series comprised of uh, seven episodes, the premise of which I have already stated in the intro. The project was uh, one of the final pieces of work toward completing my bachelor's degree in broadcast communications. Uh, Good news, by the way, I graduated. And I uh, said at the time that I would like to do another season at a later date just because well, frankly, I, I really enjoy doing this kind of thing, and I uh, I still think the format of hearing someone out and doing your best to even guide them, if necessary, to help them make the best version of their case possible, and uh, and then follow that up with as much of an interrogation as you can deliver, I still think that makes for a really interesting listening experience. And um, look, I, I am the first to admit that I've made a better job of it at some times than, than others, but... That's just how it goes. Uh, for what it's worth, I actually think the uh, the relaunch episode today is a pretty strong execution of the premise, but uh, you'll be the judge of that. Before we get into that, I've I've got a few notes on how this podcast is proceeding now that it is back. So first of all, uh, one of the most consistent complaints about the first season was that a half hour was just way too short to do weighty subjects justice. Uh, My hands were tied due to my supervisors at the time, but uh, now those shackles have been removed. So bam, full hours from this point forward. Secondly, I uh, mentioned the desire to do more seasons back then, but that's not actually how I will be approaching the podcast from uh, from now on. 5050 is going to have a completely irregular release schedule moving forward. That's due to, you know, having other commitments and the logistics of of securing guests, which honestly, now that I look back on it, I was insanely lucky to be able to get those seven episodes out with not much more than a week between each, especially considering the profile of of a lot of the guests. But even if that wasn't an issue and I was uh, putting this together full time, I think a lot of where the weaker episodes suffered from the last run was when I just couldn't successfully cram enough research into what was sometimes just a few days between confirming a guest's availability and recording to really do the subject justice. Uh, For this one, I confirmed that Mark was willing to give me an hour at some point, and then I locked in the time when I was satisfied that I was ready. And I think the final project really benefited from that approach. Uh, Although I will say, bugger tackling a legal case again anytime in the near future. Way too much reading uh, for my liking. Point is, if you like these, make sure that you are subscribed to the RSS feed or getting YouTube notifications or following me at Real Matt Orchard on Twitter because uh, you just, uh, you can't, count on uh, checking in every other Monday or whatever uh, with these. And they'll initially at least probably start out being two to three months or, or so apart as uh, as I find my bearings and, and figure out who to talk to. Uh, one more thing on that, actually. If you do have suggestions for guests uh, and or topics that you think would be 
suited to this format, let me know uh, through any channel, really, but um, including Matt Orchard. 5050 at gmail.com if you'd like to drop me a line there. I'd be particularly interested in um, having guests that you would broadly categorize as being uh, left wing, just because the uh, the previous episodes slanted uh, heavily toward controversial figures and topics from the, the right. Uh, wasn't intentional, just the way it sort of panned out in terms of who said yes. Almost got Julie Bindle on, which would have been a lot of fun, but... um. Uh, it was not to be. In any event, though, whoever you might think is good, for any reason, please let me know. Today's episode, though, isn't a political one as such, or at least it's not about left and right. It's certainly controversial, though, and uh, because there's so much going on in the case, um, Mark Pendergrast and I barely scraped the surface in terms of covering the, the various elements of the case, even with the, the new hour-long time frame. And the only way that we got as far as we did was by assuming a fair amount of prior knowledge on on behalf of the audience. So for that reason, before we kick things off, I think it's a good idea to give a little bit of a crash course on the Jerry Sandusky case for anyone listening who isn't familiar with it. Jerry Sandusky worked as an assistant coach at Penn State University for 30 years, and at the peak of his career, he was regarded as one of the best defensive coaches in college football. He was also a very active philanthropist and took a particular interest in helping disadvantaged children. In 1977, he founded a charity called The Second Mile that aimed to provide help for underprivileged youth, at-risk children, and support for their parents in Pennsylvania. He did work for The Second Mile in conjunction with his coaching duties until his retirement in 1999, after which he took an even more active role with the charity. Then in November 2011, all hell breaks loose. Jerry Sandusky is arrested and charged with dozens of counts pertaining to sex abuse of underage boys. The investigation leading up to this arrest was initially sparked by accusations of inappropriate touching from a young man by the name of Aaron Fisher, who met Sandusky through Second Mile Camps, and was taken under Sandusky's wing like many other boys before him. Ostensibly, Sandusky wanted to provide children without a father figure with a strong male role model and mentor. But it was now becoming apparent that this may have all been a ruse to get close to vulnerable children, isolate them, and begin grooming them for sex abuse. As the investigation moved on, the situation began to look all the more damning when an assistant coach named Mike McCreary testified to a grand jury that in 2001 he had walked in on Sandusky appearing to sodomize a boy in a men's shower room on Penn State campuses. It also comes out that a janitor at Penn State witnessed Sandusky perform oral sex on a boy in Penn State showers and recounted this harrowing scene to his co-workers immediately after in a state of severe distress. And it's discovered that before all of these episodes, the mother of another young boy had made a police complaint against Sandusky in 1998 due to his behavior with her son after they had shared a shower after working out in a Penn State gym. Things continue to snowball more and more after Sandusky's arrest. The university fires legendary head coach Joe Paterno due to a lack of action on his part once the McCreary incident was apparently brought to his attention. This decision leads to riots, and Sandusky makes a public plea of innocence on national television in a phone interview with sports broadcaster Bob Costas, which has since become infamous, particularly for this jaw-dropping exchange. Are you a pedophile? No. Are you sexually attracted to young boys, to underage boys? Am I sexually attracted to yes. underage boys? Sexually attracted? You know, no, I, I enjoy young people. I, I love to be around them. Um, I, I, but no, I'm not sexually attracted to young boys. More and more victims come forward with similar accusations, and ultimately Sandusky is found guilty on 45 of 48 counts pertaining to 10 victims. The whole affair dealt an absolutely devastating blow to Penn State and the community around it. To date, the university has paid out over a quarter of a billion dollars for lawsuits, settlements, and fines relating to Sandusky's actions. It is easily one of the most infamous child sex abuse scandals in American history. But what if he's innocent? For probably around 99% of people who have ever heard about the case, that is a ludicrous proposition. But 
I'm all for fringe perspectives and contrarian opinions, especially when the loudest arguments against them tend to be along the lines of everybody knows and how dare you even. And that was the general tenor of a lot of the feedback that I had seen leveled to the thesis of Mark Pendergrast's book, The Most Hated Man in America, when I first came across it after a review of it by Frederick Cruz in Skeptic Magazine, was retweeted by Jordan Peterson, who himself copped a large amount of shrill, you're a pedophile apologist type criticism for merely entertaining the notion of Sandusky's innocence. And none of that is to say that Pendergrast's theory that Sandusky's conviction was due to a combination of bunk repressed memory therapy, misunderstandings, and rank opportunism is above scrutiny, but I do think the case that he makes is certainly substantive enough to be taken seriously and engaged with in good faith. And just before I roll into the result of that engagement, I want to give a massive thank you to Ray Bleha of the Not PSU blog for agreeing to correspond with me during the opposition phase of my research and providing uh, some very valuable sources that I would not have stumbled upon without his guidance. And um, also a, a lukewarm thank you to uh, Professor Ross Chait of uh, Brown University for telling me that if I wanted to do real research, I should uh, read the court transcripts and appellate decisions for myself, which uh, proved to be very valuable advice as well, regardless of whether or not I perceived it to be delivered in a uh, relatively dismissive tone. So, without further ado, I bring you Mark Pendergrast. I am joined by freelance author Mark Pendergrast, a man who has been described by Professor Elizabeth Loftus as an enormously important contributor to the repressed memory debate. He's a freelance author who has penned many books on various topics, but central to today's discussion is The Most Hated Man in America, Jerry Sandusky and the Rush to Judgment. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. You're more than welcome. Look, there's so much to get into with this case that it's, I mean, it's hard to know where to begin, really. So I think um, the best thing for me to do is just follow your lead on that. How did you become interested in the Sandusky case to begin with? And what are the, um, I guess, the cliff notes on why you've you've come to believe with, from what I can tell, probably like 95 plus percent certainty, although correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, Jerry Sandusky is actually innocent of of everything that he has been accused of. Well, uh, a woman named Glenna Kirker, who followed the repressed memory debate uh, and who'd read my uh, book about it, contacted me by email and said, have you looked at the Jerry Sandusky case? And I said, no, but, uh, you know, I know he's guilty. Uh, everybody knows he's guilty because that guy saw him sodomizing a child in the shower. There's, you know, how do you get around that? And she said, well, you need to look at it uh, uh, more closely because, in fact, uh, he didn't witness that. And there's all kinds of evidence that there was repressed memory therapy involved in the development of some of those victims. And I said, well, I'll look at anything. And it certainly is a notorious case. Uh, so the more I looked into it, the more she was correct. Uh, so let me just start with that, uh, shower incident, if, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Uh, Mike McQuarrie, who was at the time an assistant coach, a sort of graduate student, went into the locker room one night and he overheard sounds that of slapping, which he interpreted as sexual. And he told this. Uh, that night to his father and to his father's friend, uh, his boss, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Drainoff, who came over. And Drainoff, you know, so he's, he, he, he heard, overheard the slapping sound. Then in the mirror, he saw an arm. Uh, he saw a kid peek his head around, didn't look alarmed, but an arm pulled him back in. The slapping lasted only a few seconds. And then Sandusky walked out and he thought, oh, my God, it's Jerry Sandusky and he must have been abusing that boy that I saw. So he called his father. He was very alarmed. 
this was actually probably in December of 2000. The the date got mistaken by about a year later on. There's been a lot of debate around the date itself. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And you're right. Let me just say, there's no way that I'm going to convince anybody of anything unless they actually read my book, uh, because it's so complex and it is so confusing and there are so many alleged victims. But yeah, I did become convinced that it's very likely that he's innocent. But anyway... Well Yes, sir. Girl. He told he, he he at that time, Drano kept saying, "But what did you see, Mike? What did you see?" And he didn't see anything beyond what I've just described. He heard slapping sounds. Ten years later, and this shows how memories change. The police approached him because somebody had tipped them off that he, he had uh, there had been this incident, which got reported. Uh, to Joe Paterno, and he reported it to his boss, uh, and he reported it to his boss, and he reported it to the president of the college. Um, they all concluded that this was a stupid idea for Sandusky to be showering with a kid, but Sandusky told them he'd just been horsing around with him, he had been slap boxing or snapping towels, that was the sound he overheard. McQuarrie now changed his memory when the police approached him, and he now remembered that he had seen Sandusky with the boy up against the shower and moving his hips subtly against him for two seconds. That's clearly not true. It's not what he saw. But that is fundamentally the basis for a lot of this case. Um, now, backing up a minute, Another reason, these are circumstantial things, but Sandusky and Dottie, uh, his wife, had to adopt their six children because Sandusky had very low testosterone. He had a very low sperm count. Um, he never took a plea bargain, which in cases like this where you have multiple people coming forward uh, according to most of the child abuse experts I interviewed, normal people would take a plea bargain. He had no pornography on his computer or anywhere in his house, unlike the prosecutors who were trading pornography back and forth, it turns out. He had grown up in a rec center where his uh, there was one shower, and it was where all the men uh, took showers together. So he was kind of, it turns out, I got to know Sandusky fairly well through correspondence and through visiting him in prison. And he's an incredibly naive person. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no question that he did stupid things. He took showers with kids. He put his hand on their knees and squeezed them when he was driving in cars. He hugged them even naked in showers. He, he was an idiot to do many of these things. But when I began to look into the repressed memory part of it, it was only one of the victims that I could actually uh, get to talk to me, and he was Dustin Struble, victim number seven. And it was pretty clear from his testimony if, the, if his attorney had had any brain, which he did not, that he had changed his testimony because of repressed memory therapy. He said, through counseling and through talking about different events, through talking about things in my past, different things triggered different memories, and I have had more things come back. And it's changed a lot about what I can remember today and what I could remember before because I had everything negative blocked out. And there's plenty of evidence from the other, from many of the other uh, uh, people's testimony, that they too had not remembered something in the first place and had then recalled it. Um, although I couldn't get to talk to them. So, for instance, yeah. um, Aaron Fisher, victim number one, said, "I was good at pushing it, memories of abuse, all away. Once the weekends with Jerry were over, I managed to lock it all deep inside my mind somehow." That was how I dealt with it until next time. Mike, his therapist, has explained a lot to me since this all happened. He said that what I was doing is called compartmentalizing. I was in such denial 
about everything. Also, I forgot to mention the 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 infamous shower incident that Mike McGettigan uh, reported ten years later after he changed his memory. Yeah, we know who the boy was in that shower. His name was Alan Myers. He had come forward and defended Jerry Sandusky vigorously, said, no, he never touched me. He was a father figure to me. I remember that shower very well. We were uh, slap boxing and I was sliding around and uh, knocking into the walls and having a good time. And that was me who peeked out that he saw. Um, can I interrupt really quickly, Mark? Uh, and I, I really, sure. wa- I really want to uh, make sure we do get back to Ellen Myers and unpacking that shower scene. And I also want to make time, uh, make sure we have time to unpack another one of the most famous sort of incidents that made one of the initial kind of, well, at least initial allegations that hit the media. But I just thought, be- because repressed memory is so th- central to your book, we shouldn't uh, assume too much prior knowledge. Uh, for the audience. So could you just unpack for me, how does repressed memory work? Uh, why is it so controversial? Why it has it been uh, debunked so thoroughly in your opinion? And, and then, you know, um, people have more of an idea of how it relates to this case specifically. Yeah, sure. Uh, Freud came up with this idea in 1895 that people forgot uh, terrible events. And then in the 1980s, And Freud changed his mind a couple of years later. But in the 1980s, a group of uh, largely feminist um, therapists sort of resurrected this theory and said, oh, Freud was right the whole time. And if you have uh, these symptoms of depression or eating disorders or uh, troubled marriages or basically low self-esteem or too much anger or too much sex or not enough sex, It means that you were sexually abused and that we can help you recall it. And that's faulty logic. Uh, People who are sexually abused may have some of those symptoms, but so do lots of other people. Hmm. And when you're told something like that and you're told that it's the best way to get better, uh, there's a tremendous motivation to to, to recall things. Um, And so... They would hypnotize people or they would just tell them to think about it and that they knew that they had been abused and that something might trigger them to recall it. And these are cases uh, I couldn't find one case, one convincing case of what I call massive repression of people who had forgotten multiple incidents uh, of of rape or or violent sexual abuse. And. People generally, when they recall abuse, they recall it all immediately. They don't have to, you know, mm. search their memories forever and ever and ever. So, There's a good little quote in your book. I think it might be from Loftus, but it's something to the effect of, if this is really a, a thing, then why is there not a single case of a prisoner at, at Auschwitz uh, emerging without remembering a single thing from the entire affair? Exactly. So... In the contrary, the way memory actually works is it's malleable. Um, We sort of piece together memories from all over our brains uh, to come up with something. And it's never totally accurate. But the things that are most accurate are the worst things that have happened to us. Uh, And that's what we tend to recall, the best and the worst things that happen to us so that we can avoid the worst and embrace the good. The, the, theor- the Freudian theory is that, oh, it's so terrible that you have to block it completely out of your mind. And while people might not recall every single uh, you know, aspect of repeated abuse, they probably wouldn't. They would certainly know that they had been abused. They, they don't completely forget it. So that when most of the Sandusky abusers came forward, uh, they didn't tell the police anything. It was only after a, a fair amount of prodding and with many of them being sent to therapy uh, that they came up with things. And the telltale indication is that their allegations morphed and changed and got worse o- over time. Mm. Um, so I go through each of the alleged victims in, in some detail and each of the uh, uh, unknown victims in some detail. And then One of the Sandusky sons, Matt, he got repressed memories and talked about uh, how he was just beginning to get them when he talked to the police. 
And then when he talked to Oprah, he explained how he had blocked it all out of his mind completely, but now he remembered oral abuse, oral sex, et cetera. That one's a stunning uh, one as well, because I mean, I remember uh, during the, the whole thing going down, because I have been following this since it was actually um, uh, actually, actually happening. And it was one of the, the I, I haven't looked into or really considered Sandusky's innocence until quite recently, but that is one thing Matt flipping in the middle of the trial or not even in the middle of the trial in the uh, well you know early in the prosecution's case it was one thing that actually at the time set off alarm bells for me going that is that is funny i mean i understand people kind of coming forward and and changing their story about things like abuse but to do it that late in the game is just is just odd and it doesn't seem like the media approached it critically at all at the time no, as I wrote in the, I described in, in a great deal of detail in the book how the media just sort of fueled the fire. And, you know, once once the uh, grand jury presentment was presented in, in November of 2011, it was very clear to uh, lawyers and to potential victims that Penn State was going to unload lots and lots of money on basically anybody who came forward without any vetting, and that's what happened. And the media, you know, there was a hotline put forward, and there were the cases beyond that point, I don't think, had anything to do with repressed memory. It had to do with people wanting a lot of, of course, money right, yeah. easily. Uh, and some of the most outlandish and absurd allegations came forward after that. The only two that made it to the trial were one where somebody claimed, after he first said, no, he didn't do anything to me, he claimed he was being held prisoner in his basement and not allowed to eat anything and yelled and screamed and nobody answered him, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, I think the media uh, created what I call the moral panic in this case. You know, e even with some of the ones that I, I, I think that some of the ones were I concluded probably simply lying to, to, to get money. The most to, egregious, yeah. The most egregious one was a guy named Brett Swisher House, whose father called him and said, you know, you should get a lawyer and I'll call one for you. And, you know, you could make a lot of money off of this. But even he ended up going to Mike Gillum, the sort of uh, uh, the lawyer, uh, the, the uh, a therapist who took three years to get Aaron Fisher to be uh, not the only person saying this. Everybody asks why it took so long. And if you go back and look at this, this 15 year old kid was sort of groomed <clears throat> by uh, Mike Gillum and represented, you know, told, I know you were abused. You don't have to tell me the details. Just <clears throat> I'll say, you, all you have to do is say yes or no. I'll guess what happened to you. This is classically wow, yeah. terrible uh, interviewing technique. I mean, beyond uh, leading, but, kind of putting words right in your mouth. Yeah, and the police did the same exact thing to uh, Brett House, for instance, where they they were tape recorded plotting how they were going to get him to admit more things, saying, you know, we tell everybody that that uh, everybody else has said this. They said, and it took us forever to get the first one to say anything, and that was Aaron Fisher they were talking about. It's an incredibly uh, uh, convoluted but, you know, upsetting case. I said that I wanted to make sure we had time for a particularly egregious aspect of the case, and we've still got a good, like, 12 or so minutes, so I'll just make sure I um I bring this up. We were talking about the Mike McCreary incident uh, earlier, um, and one thing that really is so fascinating about this case is that, again, as I mentioned briefly before, some of the most famous aspects of it, the things that initially really came to the attention of the media, uh, like that shower rape, for instance, which, which, um, took up so much of that, that infamous Bob Costas interview, he ended up being found not guilty on that, on that particular charge. It's funny how some of the, the most famous incidents are the ones with the least credibility. And another one that I'm thinking of that I really wanted to make sure I, I brought up is this instance where a janitor allegedly witnessed him performing oral sex in a boy in uh, in one of the showers. And I say, I mean, I say allegedly, I guess he's been, certainly he's been convicted. So I guess in the eyes of the law, um, but the, you know, the case against yeah. him, the case against him in that instance is just 
it's so egregiously cobbled together. And I think it's one of the most shocking things to read about in your book and, and in the transcripts for that matter. Can you just um give me a rundown on, on that one? Yeah, it was a double hearsay case. The janitor who supposedly saw Sandusky abusing the boy, he told another janitor about it, and that janitor is the one who was allowed to testify. So it's sort of a double hearsay case. It turns out the police did interview the first janitor who was in the process of descending into Alzheimer's. So you could say that uh, his interview, which was tape recorded, wasn't accurate. But if you read it, it's quite clear that he was positive that he had seen somebody abusing a boy or a young man, as he described him. But he was very, very adamant that it was not Sandusky, whom he knew quite well. Um, I don't think that the defense attorney ever listened to that tape recording. He never brought it up. Yeah, because I mean, I, I, he has since said in sort of appellate proceedings that oh no, he did uh, listen to it, but he didn't think it was worth it because you know, as you say, he was suffering de- from dementia. But again, I find that pretty hard to believe. What would be the downside of letting the jury know that the witness key to this accusation has gone on record saying it wasn't Jerry Sandusky? It makes no sense whatsoever. No, it doesn't make any sense. So um, <clears throat> the other case we should talk about is a previous shower incident sure. where Zach uh, Constas was an 11-year-old and Sandusky went, and I should say that the reason he showered with him is that he was a big believer that you should get exercise and that after exercise you should always take a shower. And in this case, uh, the kid's mother was very upset when she learned that Sandusky had showered with her, her son and she turned it into the police, into his therapist, what he was saying at the time. And so we know what he said. He interviewed uh, with the social worker in some detail. The social worker used, again, terrible interviewing technique, asking him over and over and over again, did he have an erection? Did he touch you? Did he soap you up? Um, Was he aroused? Did he touch you in a bad place? And he wouldn't take no for an answer. But the kid stuck, you know, said no, 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 no. What he did was... He hugged me from behind, and he said, I'm going to squeeze your guts out. And it was a joke. No, he didn't lather me up. I lathered myself up. So that's certainly disturbing to almost anyone. It disturbs me that somebody is, you know, a naked man is hugging a kid uh, and saying, I'm going to squeeze your guts out. I asked Sandusky about it. He said, you know, I was trying to be enthusiastic about it. (laughs) These kids need, you know— Someone who is uh, playful and uh, encouraging in their life, et cetera. And that's, I became convinced genuinely of the way he thought about it. So, anyway, they set up a uh, sting operation for him, and he was simply upset, very upset, that he had in, apparently upset this kid and kept telling the mother that. Um, Supposedly, he, he said, according to the police, you know, I'm so sorry. I wish I was dead. Sandusky denies ever saying such a thing, says he never would have said anything like that. And it was never tape recorded. So I rather doubt that he said that. So these are the sorts of things that are taken as him, quote, confessing. You know, he was also when they interviewed him about uh, Aaron Fisher, you know, he admitted what Fisher initially said, which was that they would wrestle both fully clothed, and that then Sandusky would uh, crack his back. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they asked him, well, did you, when you were cracking his back, did you ever put your hands under his pants, down his back? And Sandusky said, well, I don't think so. Mm, I can't say for sure, but I don't think so. Uh, Also, he called his uh, autobiography Touched. Yeah, um, the, the 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 point. Uh, just uh, to make sure I, I get the point you wanted to get a, uh, across, um, uh, right with the the last point. Sandusky has a weird way of over explaining things. Like if you ask him if the sky is blue, Sandusky gonna go, "The sky uh, blue." I mean, it's always seemed blue to me. But you know, I mean, uh, who's to say I've never had someone else's eyes? But never heard of someone else say it's a different color. So yeah, I'd, I'd probably say it's blue. Like, that's sort of just the way exactly. his manner. Yeah, right. So in the Costas interview. When Costa said, are you sexually attracted to boys? Sandusky, instead of saying, God, no, said, sexually attracted to boys? 
Hmm. No, no, I'm not sexually attractive boys. I love being around them. I like playing with them. But no, I'm not sexually attractive. It was a disastrous answer, a disastrous pause. But if you think about it, for this person who is supposed to be this incredibly practiced pedophile who had gotten away with it for years and years and years, uh, he was certainly not very practiced <laughs> in <laughs> in uh, uh, denying anything. Um, so, and you were talking uh, about touched. Yeah, touched is the name of his book, and what he meant was that he was touched by so many lives, and he had tried to help these kids. You know, the other thing I did initially was to interview all of his children, uh, uh, except for Matt, who was busy having his repressed memories. Hmm. And they all told me the same thing. They said he was a great guy. He was touchy-feely. He treated those second-mile kids the same way he treated us. Yes, he wrestled around with us. Yes, he would tickle us or crack our back. He would kiss us goodnight. Um, no, he never sexually abused any of us. Uh, he was a wonderful uh, uh, father. And he felt that if he wasn't doing good at some point during the day, he, he just wasn't doing enough. And that's why, by the way, he retired in 1999. was because he was uh, so involved in the second mile, the program that he had started, that Coach Paterno said, look, you either have to give up the second mile or uh, you're never going to be uh, the head coach. You're never going to follow me. And Sandusky thought long and hard about it and decided that uh, he would take an, an early out. They had one of these early retirement options because it was very important to him uh, to try to help troubled kids. And he went way out of his way to do it. So you've got two different perspectives. Either Sandusky is this terrible pedophile who was uh, fishing for victims through this second mile program that he started, or he was uh, an incredibly naive guy who uh, really was trying to help these kids and did, in fact, help many kids. you got to bear in mind that they found six kids who would say anything whatsoever for the trial. Um, Two of them were unknown. One was Alan Myers, who neither side wanted to use because he had flipped. One was the phantom victim of, of the janitor. You had six others, one of whom, uh, Constas, never actually said that Sandusky, he could never remember Sandusky abusing him, despite the fact that he was in therapy to try to remember it. But he concluded that he must have blacked out the rest. So he still was very upset, even though he had written wonderfully nice things to Sandusky through the years saying, you're a great guy. I'm so glad you're in my life, etc." But by the time of the trial, he had become convinced that everything was terrible. Anyway, so they had interviewed something like 600 uh, second mile kids. And when you look at their notes, the police were saying things like, I've been interviewing people and they all say Sandusky was a great guy and helped them a lot. Um, so there is, I've told them all, if they remember anything horrible, to think really hard about it and, and call me at 3 o'clock in the morning if they remember something. But, uh, you know, these are useless. Uh, so the police had a confirmation bias where they were absolutely sure that Sandusky was guilty. Uh, and they were not interested in anybody who said anything else. And they kept going after uh, the ones who were, you know, they possibly could remember something. And they would send them off to therapy to uh, try to remember things. And the lawyers that they got, the contingency lawyers, would send them off to therapy to try to remember more things. Um, and that was never brought out in this case. And uh, it's, as I say, it's not simply that. But, you know, you had the attorney general at the very end of this case saying on the courthouse steps, it was incredibly difficult for some of them to unearth long buried memories of the shocking abuse they suffered at the hands of this defendant. You could, maybe you believe in repressed memories and that's your option. Uh, and maybe you believe that he really did abuse the two uh, cases where they said something to the police the first time. And that was uh, Michael Kajak, victim number uh, five, and uh, Brett Swisher House, who was victim number four, hmm. uh, as they call them. So, you know, those those cases did bother me. And uh, I 
am pretty sure that Brett House was simply a manipulative young man, according to many, many, many people, uh, sort of a congenital liar and out for his own good. And as Sandusky himself wrote in one of the letters to him that were interpreted as these evil love letters. I uh, just one one minute uh, remaining in the first half, just you know. Okay, Brett. Brett is only out for himself. Uh, and the K Jack case, he was friends with Dustin uh, Struble. The case had already become public by then, and I can only hypothesize that he had been trying to remember things before the police finally got him to talk to him. So okay. That that's as much as we're going to get for this half an hour, and I'm sure that you are going to have many, many uh, issues to bring up uh, in the second half. So go to it. But as I let me just repeat, of course, people should read the book, read the entire book. It took me several years to write it. <clears throat> it's extremely well documented, and it explains all of this in much, much more detail than I'm going to be able to do here on this program. Well, I will. I will concede that much. Certainly, um, very well sourced uh, and well researched. And um, I mean, I mentioned to you just uh, one thing. I will say again to um, the kind of pro Sandusky side credit. Just one thing I mentioned to you when uh, I initially emailed you to look into setting this up is that I, I think the thing that always got me about this case that really g- grabbed my imagination is it's not so much that I think Sandusky's innocent. We're just about to get into that, but it is that I just think the the public certainty of his guilt is so disproportionate to the actual case. There really is a plausible or feasible case to make that he could be innocent. And, you know, watching, watching coverage and everything, you would think it was, it was a flat earth type uh, situation. So uh, there you go. One, one, one more thing I'll, I'll see you before we move on to the next half. So uh, into the fun part, Um, just a, a couple of things I want to pick up that you, you raised really quickly. Um, I do feel as if you go out of your way to give credit to Sandusky and ignore things which kind of point the other way. For instance, you mentioned his his low testosterone, and uh, you mentioned uh, in the book that, and he argues that uh, he he has abnormally low testosterone, so that would make him not a great candidate to be uh, a serial molester, which is a a decent case, but. Then when he tells you that he has sex with his wife three to four times a week, this is a man in his 70s, you're you're very quick to believe that. But to me, it seems like one or the other, right? He's either very active sexually with his wife or he's got abnormally low testosterone and that should um, deplete his sex drive. Well, I think he had his – you can have a sex drive. Uh, uh, he was quite insistent that he had only had sex with his wife, only in the missionary position, by the way. And let's have testosterone you know, into that. He, low testosterone doesn't doesn't keep you from having sex, but it doesn't make you have a, a humongous sex drive. I don't. I rather doubt that they were having that regular sex in in their seventies. You're right. Maybe in their sixties. Oh, well, okay, but I mean, when he said three yeah, to four times a week, and D- Dottie said three to four times a week. You you didn't um you didn't question that. Yeah, I probably should have questioned that more. You're right. <laughs> um, I'll grant you. Fair enough. Well, I um, can't can't say fairer than that. Um, also, the the no pornography. I've seen you make um, that point in a lot of the interviews, as well as the book, obviously. Um, I mean, yeah. the police didn't get a search warrant until about a year and a half after this investigation started. Sadowski knew he was under investigation, so if he had half his wits about him and he had pornography on that computer, he would have had plenty of time to wipe it. Well, you can't wipe it. Um, there are many, many, many cases where people have tried to wipe this stuff from their hard drives, and you can find it. So, I don't. No, I don't accept that. The Sandusky, you know, they found pictures of the kids and stuff in his office and other places, but no pornography. Uh, and you know, he didn't. I don't know. It's also the other thing I was going to say is that not not all sex offenders, pedophiles, actually keep pornography. That's not a a one hundred percent sort of clause no. with these cases. It, no, but most of them do. Right, fair enough. Anyway, it, it's it's a you know it, it it was one of the things that I thought was interesting, especially because as I said, the uh, prosecution was passing around horribly racist and misogynistic pornography between themselves. During the investigation, I thought that was quite funny. 
You know, it's certainly it's certainly ironic. Um, now the the case of of Zach Constance, victim six. That's chronologically, as you pointed out, the first victim to raise red flags in ninety eight. And um, when I was looking into this, his story is possibly the one that gives me the most pause in reconsidering Sandusky's guilt out of any of them. So I mean, for me, it's it's starting with the way that his mother's concern came about in the first place. So. As as we've covered, like it's not in dispute that he, they had showers together after workouts. And Dusky openly admits the the showering. It's the sex abuse, obviously, which is in dispute. But um, what immediately strikes me as odd is the way that Zach's mother has her attention brought to that showering. So he comes home, and this is documented in your book. Um, and he decides to say, "We took a shower just in case you're wondering why my hair's wet." And the first thing I ask myself, Mark, is, I mean, "Why on earth would a kid?" feel the need to announce having had a shower to their mom. It makes it makes me wonder if he was trying to draw attention to it. And for, I mean, like from what I understand, right, it's not it's not common for a kid in this sort of situation, let's say the allegations are true. Uh it's not common for a kid in that situation to come home and say, you know, hey mom, I've just been molested. But it would it would make sense in my mind for a kid to I mean, maybe even unconsciously try to draw their parents' attention to an event that they weren't comfortable with. Yeah, you could certainly interpret it that way. Um, The kid was in therapy for uh, being troubled in school. Uh, I think he had probably a somewhat troubled relationship with his mother. And so it's entirely possible that he came home and said, you know, knowing that she was going to get bent out of shape about this, yeah, yeah, I took a shower with him, okay, Mom? That's why my hair is wet. Uh, so you can interpret it, you know, however you want to. Yeah, um, you, you could you could look at it that way. Um, the, you mentioned the bear hugging as well, that, um, you know, that disturbed you, and you just put it down to Sandusky being just an idiot. Again, I feel like you're giving, just going out of your way to give credit with some of these things. So the bear hugging isn't in dispute. The lifting him up to the shower head over him isn't in dispute. I don't know if we mentioned that part. Um, mm-hmm. Now, he said, he said Sandusky didn't touch him inappropriately at the time. You know, these therapists keep interrogating him, interrogating him. He said, no, 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 totally fine. And uh, maybe he very well didn't view it as inappropriate at, at the time. But, I mean, frankly, again, as you've sort of conceded, hugging a naked boy while you're naked and then raising him above your head, also while you're both butt naked, I mean, that is inappropriate touching in and of itself. So no matter no matter what Zach says, Sandusky concedes it's, that he did that. Inappro- yeah, it's inappropriate, but it's not criminal. Let me just read you some of this interview, if you don't mind. Uh, go ahead, but can I just Are point you... out quickly? It was made, the point was made actually in the trial that it can actually be criminal if there's sexual intent behind it. If there is sexual intent, and they concluded this because of all the other cases, right. there was no indication whatsoever that there was sexual intent in any of this. Well, you go ahead and read that's me the what interview. I'm trying. That's why I, I really insist that you let me read some of this. I, I said, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Thank you. So he says, okay, at what point did Jerry, what did he do to you then? Well, first thing, like he was pretending to try to squeeze my guts out. He like uh, was just trying to get the shampoo out of my hair. He lifted me up. He lifted me up pretty high. So my feet were just around his waist. My back was touching his chest. Are you telling me he never touched you any place that was inappropriate? No, he did not. Did you ever? Did he ever ask you to touch him in any place inappropriate? No. Okay. Do you know what a good touch and a bad touch is? Yes, I do. It explains it. Okay. Now, are you telling me, did Jerry ever touch you in a place that was inappropriate? No, he did not. Okay. This is the last time I'm going to ask this. Okay. And he asked him again. Uh, did he touch you inappropriately when he lifted you up? No, I don't think so. Did he ever touch you on your private parts? No. Did he ever touch you, ask you to touch his private parts? Definitely no. I wouldn't have done it anyways. Okay, last time. Are you sort of telling us, not telling us everything to protect him? Okay, just, is there anything? Well, I'm just remembering this now, like the locker room, like when we were doing on the machine, I think I just remembered this now, like he... Like when I was done the first time, when I was like done on the machines and everything, he just sort of said, good job and everything. And then I like, I could sort of feel like he like kissed me once on the top of the head. Like you would kiss your child, like on the head. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not, it doesn't strike me that he's trying not to recall anything. By the time 
uh, he goes to try and and also can I, I no, said, sorry, sorry, I, I gotta I gotta pick you up on 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 all this. So um, first of all, I concede that those are completely inappropriate interviewing or you know, I, I don't know what you'd even describe it as. It's called interview for lack of a better word, interviewing techniques. Um, let me just be clear though, I, I am not. Um, trying to push the idea that during this incident in the gym, Sandusky performed any overt sex acts on Zach, or that he he explicitly uh, fondled his genitals or anything like that. What I am getting at is that I believe he was in the early stages of a grooming process in in his behavior with Zach. Now, while I was researching this incident, uh, Marker, I came across the um the notes from Zach's psychologist that detail. What happened, or what what happened as relayed to the psychologist by Zach's mother at the time? Now, I know that you've read these notes too, because you do actually reference them in in the chapter on this episode, and that interests me because I think those notes paint things in a much less ambiguous light than than your book does. So his mother, um, again, wasn't just alarmed by the "we took a shower" comment in and of itself. She says that Zach actually had a manner. And this we get into more detail where he had a he had a manner where he would tend to disclose things that bothered him uh, at the end of a conversation. So what happens is that Zach comes home. He's very excited about going to Penn State and using the equipment. Um, He had a great time, all that. Then at the end of his recounting, his demeanor changes and he makes the shower comment. And the other thing that set off alarm bells in conjunction with that in her mind is that his hair wasn't wet. That it was not wet? Yes. Okay. He also, some more details from that. Um, he started taking an abnormal amount of showers directly after this event, which is, is something that in the, from what I understand, in the kind of sex abuse profession is, is seen as something that can indicate abuse, taking an excessive amount of showers, sort of like you're trying to get yourself clean. Um, he also reported... Oh, grief. Well, <laughs> uh, well okay. Well, you, 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 let me you address that after I've um, read out the other little bullet points from this. Um, he reported that when Sandusky told him that they should take a shower, Sandusky said all the guys do it. He reported that he initially went to use the shower that was furthest away from Sandusky, but that Sandusky called him back over to use the one next to him uh, and said that he had just turned it on for him. And he reported right. that... And he reported that Sandusky told him he'd take him to movies and games, and that when he asked, when Zach asked, if his mother could come too, Sandusky said no, just him. And he reported that after Sandusky kissed him on the on the head, he said that Sandusky said, I love you. This is the first time that Sandusky and, and Zach have ever been alone together. Mm-hmm. So you go ahead. Well... You know, all of those are indications that maybe there was something weird going on, but nothing weird did happen. And it was the way Sandusky was, is what I'm trying to tell you. He well, you, wanted you, these children. You say that nothing weird did happen. All those things are weird. Are you saying that they, those things didn't happen? No, I'm not saying they didn't happen. Okay. I'm just saying that the fact that he wanted him to take a shower next to him, that he was touchy-feely with him, Etc. It's stupid, but there's no evidence that it was sexual or that it had sexual intent. I mean, as you sort of conceded yourself earlier on in this interview, grabbing a boy from behind while you're both butt naked and squeezing hard, I mean, that is... No one can prove intent. We can't look into anyone's soul. That applies to any case, but that is very sexually charged. And we, we talk about... um. Like his his time growing up in that YMCA, Rick Center, and everything. I mean, it's a it's a cultural thing and a generational thing. I think we all know. Uh, you know, you see those older guys in in changing rooms just walking around naked as the as the day they were born. And you know, men my generation are much more inclined to, uh, you know, uh, be um be a little more self conscious. But uh, yeah, that kind of activity, the grabbing from behind, the lifting a boy above your head. I, I don't know of any culture or any generation that that don't view that as weird i can't imagine any childhood upbringing uh, other than a horrible one where you would uh, mm-hmm. you would walk away thinking that that was in, in any in, in any way not um i'm trying to avoid inappropriate because you're you're conceding that much but that that thing didn't have inherently sexual connotations to it i don't think for him i don't think it had a sexual connotation but I, you know, I grant you, uh, for many people, it would. No question. 
Um, the psychologist also noted something that I thought was very valid, and it, it undercuts the whole notion that Sandusky was just a goofball who doesn't understand boundaries. She she notes that seeing as his work with Second Mile um, involves dealing with disadvantaged children, a decent amount of whom are obviously going to be victims of abuse, um, one might think that he would actually be familiar with abuse patterns and, and pedophile, pedophile overtures, as she puts it, that his, his behavior here, um, if known by others, could be perceived as, as being part of that kind of pattern. You, you're saying that Sandusky himself should have known this. Well, Sandusky deals with a lot of abused children. He's very interested in that area. So you would you would think um, that he'd probably have some familiarity with, yeah, grooming processes and, and the like. I don't think he did. You know, he would go to the camp. He would play games with the kids. He would sing uh, uh, horribly with his little group. Uh, he would play uh, sports games with them. He would throw them around in the swimming pool. Um, but his whole thing was that you should help them to do better in school. You should help them to, to do athletics more. And he was personally involved in trying to, to, to do all of that. So I don't think that he had any brain about it at all. In this particular case of Constance, the policeman said that he told him not to take showers with any kids anymore. Mm. I was thinking you would bring this up. Yep. Sandusky heard, don't take any more showers with this kid anymore, which he didn't. But he did go ahead and take showers with other kids, as we know, including the the famous one with Alan Myers three years later. You're right that I was going to bring this up, and I'm I'm glad that you're bringing it up because I, I want to address that point. I thought you'd ba- I thought you'd made that point too. So. I mean, and let, let's just conceive, uh, concede the naivety point because we can't really get that far with it. At the other day, it's either you think it was just naivety, I think it wasn't. You know, again, how far can we really get? But um, Sandusky obviously was never naive to the fact that being branded a pedophile is, within reason, going to be the worst thing that could ever happen to a person, right? So this event with Zach happens. He's confronted by Zach's mother, saying that you know Zach's never been the same since Sunday presumably pretty obvious what she's driving at. As you say, he's interviewed by authorities after this, so he's obviously aware that this behavior has has led to some level of investigation. He can't be naive to the fact that authorities at least suspect he could be a pedophile. Uh, now, as you say, this detective allegedly tells him not to shower with just boys anymore, but he protests and he recalls the instruction being just not to shower specifically with Zach anymore. Again, I'm, I'm all for conceding for the sake of arguments. Let's just give him that. So he continued, as you say, showering with and horsing around buck naked with kids after something like that, Mark. I mean, that is bonkers. If I, if, if I came that close to being branded as a pedophile, I would look at all the actions that led to that situation and swear off doing anything like that again. I imagine any half-sane person would do the same. Um, sorry if I'm getting a little worked out. It's just the, the, the only the only logical explanation, Mark, I can come up with for someone to continue showering with boys after showering with a boy got them in a situation as severe as that, as if that person really liked showering with boys, if it was something that they just couldn't give up. Well, I don't think that's the case. I think that he, he – you know, he told me anyway that he didn't think a whole lot about this. They, he, they asked him about it. How do you uh, not think a whole – I'm sorry, about how do you not think a whole lot about that? Can't you imagine being questioned about something like that with the insinuation being so obviously towards something like that? How could that not keep you up at night? Well, he said – He said – found it, it, was un, it was unfounded. He didn't know anything about this sting operation with the police. He just knew that the mother was upset. He thought she was nutty. And he uh, decided, okay, I won't shower with her anymore. She continued to be very friendly with the kid, take him to football games. And the kid ended up saying, you know, uh, hey, Jerry, just want to wish you a happy Father's Day. Greater things are yet to come. You're an awesome friend. I love you, et cetera. Um, so, I don't think he took it seriously. He should have taken it seriously. There's no question that he should have, but he didn't. Mm. Uh, so either, you know, either he's this horrible pedophile or he's uh, living in the 1950s world of uh, 
goofing around. Uh, and that's what everybody uh, who knew him concluded at the time, including uh, Paterno, who didn't like him, uh, didn't like Sandusky, and wasn't even, you know, he wasn't even a coach at that point. So it's it's pretty hard to believe that any of them, that McQuarrie would have told any of them that he witnessed uh, sexual abuse and they wouldn't have turned him into the police, but they didn't. One thing I just wanted to briefly cover as well, because you, you do often make the, the point that these victims kind of come back and you got Zach seeing those nice messages later on. Um, you know, this is years later, I think. Um, but, I mean, acquaintance offenders, pedophiles who groom their victims rather than, you know, just the uh, stranger danger type profiles, they do have a way of building these real relationships with the people that that they're abusing. I mean, you've got to bear in mind with um these these other victims who I want to spare some time for. We've got uh it's like ten minutes left, but you know a lot of them have been around him for for years and years and years. And the thing is, I mean, he's giving them access to all these kinds of things that are just completely out of their world without without him. And ninety nine point nine percent of their time with him when he's not molesting them is is absolutely great so they actually do come to feel this weird kind of almost stock at home syndrome type genuine affection for the person abusing them and again that that isn't um that isn't outside the the bounds of what's generally typical with a, a case like this it's not it's not hard for a lot of people who are informed about the subject to believe because it is as i say it's 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 not atypical it's possible but you know for instance at the sentencing hearing, Zach Costa said, I have been left with deep, painful wounds that you caused and had been buried in the garden of my heart for many years. Uh, he said he couldn't remember anything after being lifted up to the shower head because it was blacked out and that Sandusky had lathered him up with soap, etc. He clearly totally changed his attitude towards him uh, after having been gone off over by the police and probably by and, and by therapists, yeah, he decided I, that he must have blacked out something. So and, again, it's know, not he, actually it's not part of my hypothesis that Zach specifically was overtly abused. I, I think that again he was in the early stages of a grooming process with that incident at the gym, and then obviously, um, mum and the police getting involved, he he quickly got off that fix. Um, yeah. that's my version of events. Um, but and, anyway, I take your I take your point that maybe. Okay. Uh, you know, you can be abused and still uh, uh, have some nice things to say about your abuser. Let's. Uh, I, I appreciate the the concession. Uh, let's make sure we get time for this one. So, the prosecution's star witness have talked a little bit about Brett Holtz. Um Another one that was hard for me to look past, and I know you take issue with his changing story. I, I think there are probably spe some specific allegations amongst everything, which I would I would put a bit of scrutiny toward as well, just in the spirit of conceding things that should be conceded. But look, even if he might have overestimated numbers of incidents and so forth, and even if there might even be you know some exaggerations in there, this, the level of detail in his testimony is is what struck me as truthful in the main uh, reading off the page. And what I wanted to do, Mark, is just hone in on one little detail that really made me stop for a moment and just get your thoughts on it. So, um, Apologies in advance, by the way, for the one-man show here. It's just uh, the, the best way I, I think of to convey things. So, um, Holt says during the trial, <clears throat> at one time, yes, me and him and his son Matt had gone to play racquetball, and after we were, were done with playing racquetball, we had come back to the locker room. It was the same thing. You know, we went there first to get changed. When we came back, Matt got undressed and went into the shower, okay? And then me and Jerry came in. We were in there maybe... I don't know, you know, a minute or two. And that's when he started, you know, pumping his hand full of soap and threw it. And at that point, Matt got up and left. Not not got up, but just, you know, shut, shut the shower off. McGettigan says, what did he do? He went out to the other locker rooms and got a shower. He had seen the defendant starting the soap fight. Yes. This horsing around. Yes. Okay, do you know if Matt is the biological son, adopted son? Adopted, he didn't have any biological kids. Matt older than you? Yeah, yes. Did you note, and do you recall, and uh, if so, can you describe the uh, the look on Matt's face when he saw this defendant about to start the soap fight? Nervous. So Brett recalls there, Mark, behavior from Matt Sandusky that seems to indicate that Matt Sandusky might know something is about to happen, and then he leaves the shower looking nervous and this is before Matt's flip so 
wouldn't it be just a remarkably lucky detail for Brett to to make up or misremember? I'm not saying that he made it up. I'm quite sure that it's possibly true that Matt went and got a shower in the in the, uh, the other room because he didn't like uh, Sandusky playing all this crap. He and Sandusky admittedly nervous had a, a though, very... nervous. Hmm? Well, nervous is the word, though. Not annoyed, not irritated. Looks like he knows talking, something about to happen. You're talking about somebody interpreting somebody's facial expression. People are generally good readers of facial expressions. They were social animals. And this was like, you know, years back. So I... But again, a lucky mistake uh, because he yeah. doesn't... He doesn't... He has no idea that Matt's going to change his story and flip. So I'm just saying if that's the case, he really struck gold. He did strike gold because that was when Matt began to question his memories, was listening to Brett House. That's when he uh, uh, started going back and thinking, gee whiz, uh, maybe something really happened. Because, you know, Matt had testified under oath to the grand jury that his father was wonderful, uh, he'd never done anything to him, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then flips mid-trial after listening to Brett House's testimony. So. <laughs> It did have a major effect on him. There's no question about that. That's the thing as well. I mean, there's a difference between re repressed memories or completely wiping a memory and just sort of denying it, right? I mean, what what you could say could have happened there is that, yes, when, when Matt heard it, he flipped because it brought something back to him, but brought something back to him not in the sense that it was something that was buried deep down and he really literally had convinced himself it didn't happen sort of thing, but something that he had rationalized and, you know done so much good things for me and he's you know he's a girl and i don't like it but you know again the abuse can have such complicated relationships with their abusers but then he hears it like that from brett Houts's mouth and all of a sudden goes oh god he stops being in denial you know, oh god damn it it really it really was wrong not oh it really did happen but oh that thing that i was rationalizing i can't rationalize it anymore there's a difference between those two things isn't there well you can interpret it that way or you can interpret it that he um, was saying, well, I, I didn't like him holding my knee either, and I didn't like him throwing soap at me either. And I wonder if he did all these other things, because this guy is saying it. So he goes to the police, and he says, I've begun to have these memories come back. And they ask him if it's oral sex, and he says, no, but I haven't remembered that yet. And then he comes up with it later on. So I... I think that uh, the story of him going to get a shower in another place is rather flimsy evidence to base the fact that, you know, he must have done this. By the way, he, he also blames his, his suicide attempt on that he was supposedly abused by Sandusky. And I was able to get in touch with his, quote, girlfriend at the time who was living in their household who said, uh, you know, we were having a sexual relationship. They discovered it and they they uh, put a stop to it, the parents. And uh, we were like, you know, stupid teenage kids trying to be Romeo and Juliet. And so, yes, that's why we tried to commit mutual suicide and it didn't work. Thank goodness. But Matt never told me anything about being abused. And one would think he would have. One would also wonder why, at the age of 18, he would want to be adopted by somebody who is sexually abusing him. Uh, so, okay. I want to make sure a lot more of the story. I want to make sure we spend some time on Aaron Fisher. We've got literally three minutes. So, um, with Aaron Fisher, um, I think um, the the argument that he didn't allege any sex abuse until going into therapy. This is victim number one. This is the guy who sort of starts everything off, really, in, in the main. He did start um, everything off. I, you could argue Constance, but yes, no, he he did start everything off uh, in terms of the the trial um, of Jerry Sandusky. It's um the idea that he didn't allege any sex abuse until going into therapy is, I mean, if not outright wrong, I think it, at very least going with excessively strict parameters for what constitutes abuse. So in Fisher's first ever meeting with his principal, um, Aaron alleged that Sandusky would routinely get into bed with him, roll him over so they were face to face and maintain that position for around 15 minutes, 
regularly cracking his back during that time, um, bringing them even closer. So, I mean, if that isn't molestation, and it might not technically be, it's at least molestation adjacent. Well, the 15 minutes, who knows whether it was 15 minutes. But after they would wrestle, he would crack his back. There's no question about that. And it would be on the bed. Sandusky (laughs) says... You know, it was a comfortable place to to crack his back. We weren't in the bed. We were on the bed. Yes, yeah, so Sandusky's um, claiming the bed stuff never happened. He would say sometimes they'd wrestle in, in lieu of a mat- uh, they'd wrestle on a mattress in lieu of a mat, and sometimes he'd allow Aaron to pin him um, for a time, and they'd hold the position for, like, I think a minute or so. He's saying that's, that's Sandusky's version, right? No, I think he, he admitted that he did it on the bed sometimes. Yeah, they would sometimes do it back on. Back. Yeah, they do it on the bed in lieu of a in lieu of a mat, so in, instead of a mat. Mm-hmm. But I mean, even if yeah. you give him, even if you give him that, right? So he's saying this is again, it's before therapy. So in this instance, you are you're basically saying Aaron is flat out lying. He hasn't been influenced to make up the bed thing. If it was, and it's it's not close enough to the the wrestling version. Of I'm not the, saying I'm not saying he's lying about uh, having his back cracked. Well, no, not about uh, his back cracked, about the lying in bed, in bed, getting in bed with him and lying on, on top of him for 15 minutes or getting him to lie on top, Sandusky getting Aaron to lie on top of him for 15 minutes. You're saying he is lying about that, right? You must be. I'm not saying he's lying. I'm just not saying it's necessarily 15 minutes. Your interpretation of how long things are can can vary. Okay. Well, but, I'm, And I'm not saying that that's not a, an inappropriate and stupid thing to do, but I'm saying that's what he did. Well, and even if it, I guess my point is, let's just be as generous as possible about what actually transpired. Um, if it was just a wrestling man and it was just allowing Aaron to pin him, <clears throat> pardon me, a full minute of being in the pin position. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a wrestling expert, but I imagine in wrestling, it's pretty obvious uh, who's been bested after five, ten seconds of being pinned. So a straight minute uh, to allow a, a boy to to have you in the pin position is. Again, just still in and of itself, even if that's as bad as it got, it's still very bizarre to imagine. Yeah, I can I can grant you that. It's uh, unusual. Okay. Well, Mark, that is it. I think it's been a very spirited one. I I really appreciate you making the time, and I think it's been uh, a substantive exchange. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.